You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. This is the Useless Information Podcast. I am Steve Silverman. Useless Information. Perhaps you saw in the news on March 24th that 61-year-old daredevil slash limo driver Mad Mike Hughes took a ride in his homemade steam-powered rocket above the Mojave Desert. Maxing out at a height of 1,875 feet, or 572 meters, he landed just 1,500 feet, or 460 meters, from his launch site. Parachute slowed his descent back to terra firma, but the landing was a bit rough. While he did survive, he celebrated his successful flight while strapped to a stretcher in the back of an ambulance. The one detail that many of the news stories had skipped over was the real reason that Hughes was doing this. He set out to prove that the Earth was flat. While it has been known since the time of the ancient Greeks that the Earth was spherical, Hughes was determined to prove that this was wrong. He, along with a number of other believers around the world, are certain that the Earth is a flat disk. Please welcome to the podcast my colleague Justin Forrest. Justin is an earth science teacher at Chatham High School, and the two of us co-teach one of these classes together. Each year we have to convince students that the earth is nearly spherical, an oblate spheroid to be more precise, and the kids are expected to be able to have an understanding of the various pieces of evidence for the state exam. In other words, they need to be able to prove that this is true. So I thought it'd be fun if the two of us did a 1970s 60 minutes point counterpoint style debate on the topic. And this is probably best remembered today for the parody of the segment that was done on the original Saturday Night Live. It was between Jane Curtin and Dan Aykroyd. Some of you may remember the catchphrase, Jane, you ignorant, whatever. Anyway, Justin will take the part of the spherical Earth believer, and I will prove to you that the Earth is indeed flat. So the first piece of evidence is during a lunar eclipse, the shadow of the Earth has a curve, um, uh, creates a curved shadow on the moon. Justin, you ignorant geek. I mean, come on, you can take a paper plate and shine a flashlight behind it and I can make a curved shadow on something. That doesn't prove anything. The second piece of evidence is ships going over the horizon. Okay, as they go over the horizon, the last thing you see is the top of their masts. Justin, you need to drop your membership in that cult you call science. You probably don't know about the Bedford Level experiment that was done by Samuel Burley Rothbaum in 1838. He had someone row a boat six miles along a canal, and he had a telescope that was eight inches or 20 centimeters above the canal. And the whole time that that boat rowed down the canal, it stayed visible the entire time. The third piece of evidence is if you go to a higher position, a higher elevation, you can see further. Justin, are you blind? I mean, I just have to go up on top of a mountain and look out, and clearly I can see further. That has nothing to do with the Earth being round. The fourth piece of evidence is the other planets, the moon. They're all spherical. Justin, I think those neurons in your brain have stopped firing. I mean, come on, look at it. I mean, you can look at the moon, it looks perfectly flat. Look at any planet, it looks flat. Clearly the Earth is flat. My final argument is that we've been to space. We have pictures, telescopes. We, we can see pictures of the Earth, and it's spherical. Justin, you're just a Bill Nye the science guy wannabe. You really need to start thinking for yourself. I mean, come on. I mean, just look at any picture. It's perfectly flat. And have you ever heard of Photoshop? Clearly those images are made up. Of course, the two of us are just joking around a bit here. We could have easily provided many more arguments both for and against, but there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that the Earth is a slightly flattened sphere. Yet, there'll always be doubters, no matter how much proof they're presented with. Which leads to today's story, which also involves what I believe is bogus science. It's one that I briefly talked about way back in April 2008 in podcast episode number 13. That's the one that I did on Henrietta Swan Levitt. That particular episode is quite significant in my mind because it was the first story that I had researched and written specifically for this podcast. 
Prior to that, I'd been retelling stories from the books that I had previously written. So imagine, if you will, a blue planet that lies third away from the bright star that it orbits. This planet has everything needed to support life. It is neither too hot or too cold, it has plenty of liquid water, and an atmosphere that shelters organisms from the worst of that star's radiant energy. If this sounds a bit like Earth, you are correct. That is the planet that I'm referring to. The story continues with a voyage that sets sail in the early 1800s through the Bering Strait, and its intent was to explore the uncharted territory of the North Pole. After passing through an incredibly brutal, ice-covered region, the ship would start to slowly descend at a nearly imperceptible rate until it reached the inside of the Earth. There, the crew would find an interior world that was gently bathed in reflected light from the world above. Abundant riches would be discovered, and the crew of the ship would be the first humans to make contact with the leaders of this underworld paradise. This really sounds like something out of science fiction, doesn't it? In fact, a number of science fiction stories were based on this concept, the most famous of course being Jules Verne's Journey to the Center of the Earth in 1864. What you may be surprised to hear is that this pseudo-scientific theory was something that Congress considered funding in the 1820s. No one can say with any certainty as to where the theory of a hollow earth originated. It's an idea that has been part of folklore and religion since the earliest of times. Yet, at least for today's podcast, perhaps the best place to begin is with Sir Edmund Hawley, or Haley as he's pronounced in the United States. He's the guy who had correctly calculated that the comet that bears his name today would reappear every 76 years or so. Unfortunately, he didn't live long enough to see it happen again, but he did predict correctly. In 1676, Haley went to the remote island of St. Helena in the South Atlantic, and his purpose was to set up an observatory to study the stars of the Southern Hemisphere. While on this journey, he became puzzled with the fact that the magnetic compass readings varied quite a bit. Haley theorized that these inconsistencies could be best explained by revisiting the ancient concept of a hollow Earth. He proposed that the Earth was made of three inner spheres, each one with its own magnetic field, and each one was spinning at a different speed. In order for these inner spheres to spin independently, he suggested there needed to be some sort of atmosphere between each of the layers. Haley further speculated that it may be possible that one could access the interior of the Earth, and that would be through large holes that existed in each of the poles. It was through these holes that light from the sun would enter and illuminate this interior world. He also suggested that the atmospheric gases could also escape through these holes, and that would produce the spectacular light of the aurora borealis. Haley wrote in 1692, quote, The concave arches may in several places shine with such a substance as invests the surface of the sun, and I have adventured to make these subterranean orbs capable of being inhabited. So what evidence did Haley have for these interior worlds? Absolutely none, you know, other than it being a possible way to explain the varying magnetism of the Earth. Now, this is not to diminish how great of a scientist Haley was. You need to keep in mind that while there was no evidence supporting his theory at the time, there was nearly as little evidence opposing it. Haley's theory of a hollow Earth is armchair science at its best. Haley may have been the one who brought the hollow earth theory into the scientific thinking of his day, but there really was no one who did more to advance the theory forward than a man named John Cleve Sims II. Born on November 5, 1780 to Mercy and Thomas Sims in Sussex County, New Jersey, he was named after his uncle who was a delegate from New Jersey to the Continental Congress. He was later a judge and pioneer of the Northwest Territory. The Elder Sims was clearly a prominent man, and he was also both father-in-law to President William Henry Harrison and great-grandfather to President Benjamin Harrison. 
The younger Sims received a common school education and joined the U.S. Army on April 2, 1804 as a low-rank commissioned officer. After moving up through its ranks, he was ultimately promoted to captain on January 20th of 1812. He remained in the military throughout the War of 1812 and became a minor hero during the Battle of Niagara. He retired from the military in 1816. Flashback eight years earlier to Christmas Day of 1808, and we find that Sims married Mrs. Mary Ann Lockwood. She was the widow of Captain Benjamin Lockwood. At the time of their union, she was the mother of five daughters and one son. The couple would produce five more children, including daughters Louisiana and Elizabeth, sons Americus Vespucius, yeah, that was his name, another John Cleves, and William Henry Harrison Sims. It wasn't very long before Sims lost interest in both his business and his ever-expanding family. You see, his true passion turned out to be the study of science. He had become an avid reader and slowly morphed all of the evidence he had gathered into a clear theory of how the Earth was structured. Unfortunately, it would later be proven wrong. What Sims now needed to do was share his amazing theory with the world. And to do so, in 1818 he had 500 copies of a brochure printed up and then he mailed it to elected officials, philosophical societies, and institutions of higher learning both within the United States and abroad. He wrote, I declare the earth is hollow, habitable within, containing a number of solid concentric spheres one within the other, and that it is open at the poles 12 or 16 degrees. I pledge my life in support of this truth and am ready to explore the hollow if the world will support and aid me in the undertaking. Farther down in the document, Sims makes the following a request, quote, I ask 100 brave companions well-equipped to start from Siberia in the fall season with reindeer and sleighs on the ice of the frozen sea. I engage we find warm and rich land stocked with thrifty vegetables and animals, if not men, on reaching one degree northward of latitude 82. We will return in the succeeding spring. Attached to the publication was a certificate attesting to his sanity, which really did little to convince others. So after two years of unsuccessfully trying to promote his theory, he realized he needed to find a different avenue to do so. He turned to the lecture circuit. Sims gave his first lecture in 1820 before a large audience in Cincinnati. He was an awful orator. His talks were supposedly poorly organized and difficult to follow. Even worse, he supposedly spoke in a dry, nasal tone. Yet oddly, the uniqueness of his topic, coupled with his great enthusiasm for the subject, made him incredibly popular on the lecture circuit. And while he may have been ridiculed in the press, Sims soon gained the large number of followers throughout the Midwest and the South. If nothing else, Sims was great at working out all the kinks in his hollow earth theory. Should anyone find a flaw, he was quick to come up with a convincing theory to explain it all away. So let's take a quick look at some of the pieces of his theory. Here we go. Bad science point number one. Sims stated that Newton was completely wrong about gravity. Newton claimed that every object in the universe was attracted to every other object by the pulling force of gravity. You probably didn't know this, but I'm attracted to you and you're equally attracted to me. You know, equal and opposite. But our masses are far too small, and of course the distance between us is far too large for us to notice that tiny, tiny, tiny pull. Gravity is the weakest of all forces. Sims took the opposite approach. Instead of gravity being a pulling force, he said that gravity must be a pushing force. That's because the entire universe was theorized by leading scientists of the day to be filled with a gas known as ether. Those were tiny invisible spheres that filled space. And that's how light got from the sun to us. Basically would travel through these particles called the ether. 
Well, according to Sims, it was the elasticity of these ether particles that held the universe together. As you stand in the spot that you're in right now, you are deforming those microscopic rubber ether balls, and they are then pushing you against the Earth. All one needs to do is look out into space to confirm this is true. Because if gravity was a pulling force as Newton proposed, then the whole universe should just collapse in upon itself. It's only logical, at least according to the theory put forward by Sims, that it's a pushing force that keeps everything in its place. That's why the sun stays up there, the moon stays up there, and all the stars stay up there. Now let's move on to bad science point number two. Sims stated, quote, A nebular mass in rotation, as our Earth during its formation, will not assume the form of a solid sphere, but rather a hollow one. He felt that as the primitive cloud of dust and gas had formed our planet spun round and round, centrifugal, that's with an F, centrifugal force would naturally throw all the material outward and, of course, produce a hollow sphere. Now, just a little side note here. As hard as it is to believe for many, some of my students included, what we perceive as centrifugal force is really an imagined force that doesn't exist. But I diverge. Sims argued that nature was an economist when it came to matter. You see, if the stalks of plants, the shafts of feathers, and supposedly bones are hollow, then it only makes sense that the planet should be hollow also. Bad science point number three. Sims agreed with Haley that there had to be large holes at the north and south poles of the Earth. He estimated that the North Hole was about 4,000 miles or 6,400 kilometers in diameter, and the South Pole Hole was larger at 6,000 miles or 9,700 kilometers. As previously mentioned, the holes were tilted at an angle of 12 degrees to the equator, which would make one side of the hole much closer to the pole than the other. Just how he came up with these numbers is anyone's guess. I don't think anyone knows. Supposedly the curvature of each rim would be so gradual that it would, quote, not be apparent to the voyager who might pass from the outer side of the earth over a rim and down the inner side a great distance before becoming aware of the fact at all. In other words, you wouldn't just tumble off the edge and fall into the earth's interior. He added that an aerial fluid would gently push against the explorer's ship and that would safely bring them down to the land or water surface below. Once passing through the 1,000-mile or 1,600-kilometer thick crust, there would be a total of five interior spheres. Think of it kind of like a matryoshka doll, you know, one of those Russian nesting dolls, one inside the other. Next up, you guessed it, is bad science point number four. He said the gas would escape through the openings located at the poles of each of these inner worlds. This, he concluded, was the cause of the world's earthquakes and volcanoes. Hard to believe I've been teaching plate tectonics to my students all these years. I've just been wrong about it. Anyway, it would be through these holes that light from the sun would enter the interior of the earth, and it would be reflected off both the interior roof and the ground beneath. That would bathe the interior with a soft, subdued light. Sims calculated that light could reach as far as 18 degrees from the equator on the high side in the north and within 10.5 degrees from the southern opening. Supposedly, the region around the equator would forever be in a perpetual state of twilight. And finally, we have bad science point number five. You know, even today, it's difficult to explore the Arctic and Antarctic regions of the Earth. The temperatures are just too extreme, and the ice seems, you know, just about everywhere. Well, I know you're going to be shocked by this. Sims disagreed. His theory explained that what was perceived by explorers to be an impenetrable wall of ice was really the rim of the openings at the poles. All one needed to do was sail beyond this frozen wasteland, and then you can enter the tropical world below. And according to Sims, there was ample evidence that this underworld really did exist. All one needed to do was look at the vast number of animals, and he included whales, reindeer, seals, polar bears, and so on. 
all you needed to do was look at these animals and they all migrated towards the poles each winter and somehow they came back each spring sleek and fattened up. He concluded this could only happen in a world which was warm, lush, and provided them with ample food. So that's the bulk of Sim's concentric sphere theory. In 1819, he moved his family to Newport, Kentucky, and he began to gather his first hollow earth disciples. Of course, having a theory, no matter how far-fetched it may be, you know, that's fine, but ultimately science must prove it one way or the other. It's either going to be right or it's going to be wrong. Lacking the resources to fund an expedition to the North Pole himself, Sims turns to the United States government for help. One can't simply walk into Congress and ask for money directly, so he convinced Kentucky Senator Richard M. Johnson, who would later serve as vice president under Martin Van Buren, he asked Johnson to do so for him. On March 7, 1822, Johnson asked the Senate, quote, to equip and fit for the expedition two vessels of 250 or 300 tons burden. Unfortunately, the motion was tabled, but Sims was not deterred. He spent the next 10 months gathering public support, and then he used his base to convince Johnson to try once again. In January of 1823, Johnson petitioned Congress to finance an expedition led by, you guessed it, Captain John Cleve Sims, late of the United States Army, into the depths of the earth. Quote, The national honor and public interest might be prompted by the equipping of an exploring expedition for the purpose of penetrating the polar region beyond the limits already known, with a view not only of making new discoveries in geography, natural history, and geology, but you're going to love this part, but of opening new sources of trade and commerce. Just like being the first to the moon, Johnson suggested that being the first to the interior of the earth would bring the United States great prestige on the world stage. And since there's such a great potential for establishing trade with the inhabitants of the interior, it made sense for Congress to assign the petition to the Committee on Commerce. Well, as you can guess, the idea was once again tabled. As you'd expect, Sims refused to give up, and soon Congress was swamped with new petitions in support of a voyage into the Earth's interior. Finally, in December 1823, the financing of Sims' expedition was put up for a vote. Amazingly, 46 of our elected officials voted in favor of funding the voyage. 56 were opposed, and as they say, close but no cigar. In 1824, Sims moved to Hamilton, Ohio to live on a parcel of land that his namesake uncle had willed to him. It was here that he also gained a wealthy disciple named James McBride. While Sims may have written quite a bit promoting his theory, it was McBride who assembled it all into one cohesive volume. It was titled Sims' Theory of Concentric Spheres. If you get bored, just do a quick search for it. It's readily available on the internet. In 1827, Sims learned that Russia was planning a trip to northeastern Siberia. So he wrote to Count Romanov, who at the time was the Chancellor of Russia under Tsar Alexander, and he offered up his services. You see, Russia had been far more receptive to his hollow earth theory, and they in turn accepted his offer. Sims had finally found his passage into the earth. But there was one minor detail that prevented him from making his dream voyage. He didn't have the money to pay his fare from the United States to St. Petersburg. So it never happened. Yet, just the simple fact that Russia accepted him, that was enough to significantly boost his legitimacy back home. Later that year, Sims fell ill with severe stomach problems and was taken to New Jersey to be cared for by friends and relatives. Once he was well enough, he made the trip back to his family in Ohio in February of 1829. Sadly, he died a few months later on May 29th of 1829 at the age of 49. During his final years, donations and the fees that he collected from his lectures, they helped to pay the cost of him being out on the road, but it covered little more. 
at the time of his death, he was basically insolvent. His wife, Marianne, was able to support her family by renting out the farmland she inherited from both of her husbands, but it really was tough. So I guess the question is, was Sims a crackpot or a genius? Let's just say that history has not been kind to him. There's no doubt that Sims was an intelligent man who excelled at gathering and synthesizing information. And while his ideas proved to be wildly wrong, he does deserve credit for making the public aware of the need for polar exploration. The theory of a hollow earth did not die with John Cleve Sims. Even though he left his family destitute, his son America has never wavered in championing his father's theory of concentric spheres. In his honor, America's had a stone memorial constructed in Hamilton, which still stands to this day. It is topped with, you guessed it, a globe that is hollow at its poles. Today, mankind has reached both poles many times. You know, pilots have flown their airplanes over them, satellites view the poles from above, and not a single person has ever observed an opening at either end. Then you have seismologists who have used earthquake data to study the interior of the Earth, and they have long determined there are no interior worlds. Yet, just like those that still believe the Earth is flat, there are those that still preach that the Earth is hollow inside. Useless, useful, I'll leave that for you to decide. You are listening to the DuPont Cavalcade of America, starring Elizabeth Taylor as Mary Peabody. Sponsored by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. One of the newest of the DuPont Company's better things for better living through chemistry is teal rubberized fabric for convertible auto tops. This improved top fabric is uh, it's made like a sandwich. In the middle is a layer of DuPont neoprene rubber. And on either side are specially woven fabrics dyed to give maximum resistance to fading. Teal rubberized fabric is constructed to retain its original shape and resist shrinkage through long use. Before this new fabric was placed on the market, it was field tested for two years by DuPont in cooperation with the automotive industry. Ask your local car dealer or auto top man about this new fabric for convertible auto tops. Teal rubberized fabric is another of the DuPont company's better things for better living through chemistry. That commercial for DuPont is from the March 21st, 1950 broadcast of the Calvocate of America radio program. As you just heard, this particular episode was titled Mary Peabody and starred the legendary Elizabeth Taylor. The show ran on radio from 1935 until 1953, and it also ran on television from 1952 until 1957. At first glance, it would seem odd that DuPont would need to advertise, since none of their products were sold directly to the public at the time. You know, they made the raw materials like explosives, nylon, neoprene, Teflon, Mylar, Kevlar. You know, the list goes on and on. But they didn't make the end product. They made them for other manufacturers to use in their products. But DuPont's public image was highly tarnished in the 1930s because they stood accused of making a fortune by profiteering during World War I. Roy Durston, who had become the creative director at the firm Batten, Barton, Durston, and Osborne, he came up with the idea of DuPont creating and sponsoring a show to change their image. That show became Calvocate of America, and it played a big part in rebranding DuPont as a company that made products that benefited Americans. Today, a number of these products have become both health and environmental concerns, and of course they once again painted DuPont in a negative light. You know, perhaps they need to relaunch Calvocate of America. Maybe that will do the trick. And since we're on the topic of science, here's a question for you. Sir Edmund Haley, who I had mentioned briefly at the beginning of this podcast, he felt so strong that his friend's writing should be published that he paid for most of the cost out of his pocket. So can you name this work or its author? I'll give you credit either way. Either name the work, the author, or both. It doesn't matter. I'll let you know the answer at the end of this podcast. In other news, here are three additional stories that have some unusual science involved. 
In our first story, which appeared in the national news on May 1st of 1959, it was reported that Soviet scientist Iosef Shlavsky had found evidence that the two moons of Mars, that's Phobos and Daimas, they may be artificial. In other words, they may have been placed in orbit by Martians. Hmm. You see, Shlavsky had studied data that had been collected by others, and he concluded that Phobos in particular was most likely hollow inside and possibly had a thin sheet metal-like exterior. He claimed that its behavior could not be explained by comparing it to any known natural satellite in our solar system. Instead, it behaved much like the artificial satellites that man had placed in orbit around the Earth. So the logical conclusion was that the Martians had placed the two moons in orbit some two or three million years prior. Further study later determined that the data that Shklovsky used to make these predictions, which he didn't collect himself, had systematic errors. It's not that Shklovsky did bad science, you know, that whole Martian idea excluded. It's just that he had really bad, bad data to work with. A number of space probes have since been sent to study these two moons, and today we're certain that they are solid, naturally made, and very similar to many of the asteroids out there. Our next story appeared in the press a couple of months after that Martian story. On June 30th of 1959, a UPI article discussed how two U.S. government scientists, that's DeWitt Stetton Jr. and John Z. Heron, they were studying the relationship between gout and intelligence. Just in case you don't know, gout is caused by the accumulation of crystals of uric acid in bone joints, and for those who have it, it's quite painful. Well, a theory was put forward in 1955 that the uric acid also stimulated the brain. And you can probably see where this is going. Those with gout should be smarter. So Stettin and Heron decided to test out this theory. They went to the Army Recruitment Center in Fort Dix, New Jersey, and they measured the uric acid levels in 817 men. Their next step was to compare the results of these tests to the Army Classification Battery. That was a group of psychological tests they gave the men to test for intelligence and other abilities. The two found that there really was a slight correlation between uric acid levels and high intelligence. Now, they didn't make any definite conclusions here, but they did recommend that further studies needed to be done. The press was quick to point out that 19 times as many men have gout than women, so the logical conclusion from this is that there must be 19 intelligent men for every intelligent woman. I can tell you just from my many years of teaching that this is definitely not true, and I don't need any scientific study to prove that. So what is your remedy for a case of the hiccups? You know, do you have someone scare you? Do you drink a glass of water quickly? Do you consume a spoonful of sugar, maybe? Or do you stick a rubber tube up your nose? Hmm. Well, my guess is you've never tried that last one. Yet there's an article in the Associated Press on October 2nd of 1967 that suggested that the rubber hose method may be the best. A team, which consisted of three doctors at the University of Chicago and a colleague at Cairo University, they found that hiccups could be cured by sticking a flexible rubber tube up a patient's nose and stimulating the nerve endings of the pharynx. The researchers found that this method was successful in 84 of 85 patients that they had tried it out on. They cautioned this was not a do-it-yourself type cure. Due to its potential danger, the procedure needed to be done by a trained doctor. So they got me thinking, by the time I get in my car, drive all the way to the doctor, you know, sit in the waiting room for, I don't know, about an hour before I'm called in, my hiccups will be gone. I didn't need any rubber hose. I guess that's why this method worked. So earlier I had asked you if you could name the publication that Edmund Hawley or Edmund Haley, depending on which country you live in, the one that Edmund Haley paid for out of his own pocket. Did you know? Well, if you guess the Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, which most people don't know, or what is more commonly known as the Principia by Sir Isaac Newton, you would be correct. 
The story goes that when Newton presented his three-volume masterpiece to the Royal Society in 1686, they had already blown their publishing budget on the Historia Piscium, that's the history of fishes, and it sold really poorly. With the Royal Society lacking the funds to have Newton's works published, Haley took it upon himself to do so. And while he was able to get some financial support from others, he ended up paying for almost all of it out of his own pocket. Of course, few people knew at the time how groundbreaking Newton's work would be, so only 250 copies were initially printed. If you have one of those, it is priceless. The volumes detail the laws of planetary motion, the tides, gravitational attraction, just so much more. Of course, what most people best know it for is Newton's three laws of motion. You know, an object at rest stays at rest, you know, and so on. Without a doubt, physical science would never be the same after the publication of the Principia in 1687. Well, that brings another episode of the Useless Information Podcast to a close. I'd like to thank my colleague Justin Forrest for his help in proving that the Earth is not flat. Just a reminder to like this show on Facebook, and if you haven't done so already, I'd greatly appreciate it if you could head on over to iTunes and leave some positive comments about the show. The Useless Information Podcast is part of the Recorded History Podcast Network. Be sure to point your browser to recordedhistory.net to learn about all the quality history podcasts that this network has to offer. Anyway, thanks again for listening, and I hope you tune in next time. Bye.